questions. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, of course, every time we learn together, it's exciting, but I'm particularly excited uh, about this shiur, our last one on Sefer Yechezkel, and uh, please God, we're going to finish with the Hadron at the very end, uh, at the end of, uh, of this, this shiur. Um, so maybe just by way of introduction, I want to start with a little bit of background. Um, the Rambam articulated for us 13 principles of faith, the Ikari Emuna, right? Fundamentals of faith, which he says are a prerequisite for a Jew to attain Olam Haba. If you want, you know, the world to come, the good side of it at least. So uh, you need these three, 13 principles of faith, um, you know, in your belief system. For example, says the Rambam, a Jew who says that uh, he doesn't believe in God, you know, God forbid, or uh, that he gave us the Torah and that Mashiach will one day come. So if any Jew explicitly denies any of those principles, so that's called heresy. It's a rejection of one of Judaism's fundamental principles. And again, it carries with it uh, a severe uh, spiritual penalty. But because it's so hard for us to remember all the details of those 13 beliefs, so we have a few different useful summaries uh, you know, in our uh, liturgy. So for instance, in the back of our sitter, uh, many of us might be familiar, we have the 13 animamis, right? The 13 things animami, which I believe in. And that's really, just to summarize, each one of those is a summary of one of the Ikari Amuna, one of those fundamental principles in a single sentence. Yigdal also, um, you know, which we sing is also a condensed summary of those 13 principles. So one of those 13 principles is the one that I want to focus on today because the concluding prokim in Yechezkel seems <coughs> so dramatically conflict with it. So here's the ninth Ikar. I'm going to go and, uh, and pull it up, uh, at least the way it's summarized in Animami. So over here, just the first one, this is the, the um, ninth one. So Animami ben Shalema, I believe with complete faith, Shizos HaTorah, this Torah, Lo Sehei Muchlefes. This Torah will never be changed, it will never be exchanged. There will never be another Torah, there will never be uh, another set of laws from, from uh, Hashem. So anyone want to tell me uh, which line in Yigdal that corresponds to for anyone who uh, remembers the, the song offhand? <laughs> You're welcome to sing it. <laughs> Right, Bob's got it. Lo yachalif hakel v'lo yamir daso, or for those uh, who will be more helpful, lo yachalif hakel v'lo yamir daso. Right, so lo yachalif hakel that Hashem will not be machlif; He will never switch out dato his of lo yamir dato, and He will never again exchange dato his religion. The olamim lezulaso forever for another one. His his Torah, the the religion, He's never going to change. Um, he's never going to change. But these are both paraphrases. Again, these are summaries of the Ikari Amuna. The Ikari Amuna really spelled out at much more length and detail by the Rambam. And we're missing some details. Any summary by definition misses some of the details. Uh, so it's important to know what the Rambam actually says for us to appreciate the difference, uh, or seeming difference between that Ikari and what the basic understanding of Yechezkel says. So let's just read this together. This is the Rambam in his Mishnah Torah, his magnum opus, spelling out um, basically what this Ikari uh, entails. So he says, Davar barur umuforash batorah. It's a clear, explicit thing in the Torah. Shehi mitzvah, um, shehi mitzvah, sorry, umuforash batorah, shehi mitzvah umenet la olam uliome olamim. That it, the Torah, is a mitzvah, it is a law, meaning the laws within it are eternal. Ein la lo shinui velo geyaron velo tosefet. There is no change that's going to occur in the Torah. There's nothing that will be taken away, and there's nothing which will be added. And then he brings some psukim to... Uh, to uh, prove that point, we can skip the psukim and jump to the bold. Halamanita, so here you have therefore learned, shekol divrei Torah mitzuvin anu asotan adolam. All of the words of the Torah, you, we will have to go and fulfill forever for eternity. And he then goes on to go and bring up psukim again to that effect. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, skip, uh, we'll skip to here. Lefichach, bottom line on the page. Lefichach, im yamod ish, if a person will come, whether he is a person from the Jewish nation, right, or from the non-Jewish nations, and he's going to go and do a miracle, and also are different types of miracles, and he's going to say, he says, I come, and I'm coming to tell you that there is another mitzvah, or there is one less mitzvah, you can forget about a mitzvah, 
He says, hey, you know that mitzvah which you thought meant X, Y, and Z? So here's a different explanation. I know you didn't hear it from Moshe, but really it's A, B, C. He changes the meaning of a mitzvah. Or he says that, no, those mitzvahs were only temporary. Um, so if someone were to say that, if a Navi were to do that, even if he were to do miracles, he is a false prophet. Because he is coming to go and contradict the Nebua of Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu's Nebua was that we keep the 613 mitzvahs the way he said them, and all 613 of those. And this prophet, who's even doing miracles, if he tells you to do one of these things, we have an obligation as a nation to go and kill him with strangulation, you know, uh, not the most uh, pleasant of, of things, because he is lying, he is a false prophet, and the penalty for lying as a false prophet is quite severe because it could really throw things off um, religiously. So just to clarify, so what's, what's this ikar really when it comes down to it? The proper precise belief is that every single mitzvah will exist the exact same way forever. None of the mitzvot will ever change, and if a prophet ever tells you otherwise, so you know he's a false prophet, and is subject to the death penalty. Good. So that's that. That's the background. Now it happens to be just for uh, just so that we uh, put all the all the details out there. It happens to be that the Rambam's opinion was not unanimously accepted in the times of the Rishonim. So uh, Rav Yosef Albo, who lived in the uh, early 1400s, he has a book called the Sefer Ha'i Karim, where he also goes through what he thinks are the principles of faith, and he disagreed. He says the Torah has changed many times. The Torah, so to speak, in Adam's time was very small. He was supposed to be a vegetarian, we know. And then it changes uh, in, in Noah's time. All of a sudden, Noah's allowed to eat meat. So you see the Torah changed once. And it changed again in Abraham's time when the Gid HaNasheh became prohibited. All of a sudden, Abraham gets hit. And, uh, and now uh, Gid HaNasheh is a problem. And then uh, Matan Torah changes again when we're given the 613 mitzvot. Okay, so he argues that it keeps on changing. So he argues, what's wrong to say? Is it really so problematic to say? It's going to change again. Just like it changed from Adam to Noah to Abram to Matan Torah. Maybe there's another change, he says. It can continuously change. There's nothing heretical about saying such a thing. But his opinion was always a minority view. Um, the overwhelming majority of our Mepharshim view Matan Torah as the culmination of the Torah's development. And Rishon after Rishon generally assumes that the Torah cannot and will not change. And that's become basically the normative view in Judaism, which is why it's in the back of your sitter in uh, Animamin and why we sing it in uh, Yigdal, basically. Okay, so we're going to connect all this to, to, to Yechezkel in a moment, but all this is just, just the background so that we can really appreciate what's, what's going to happen. So just by the way, as an aside, can anyone tell me from a historical prep perspective why this Ikar is so important, so to speak, uh, or why it would be important to cling to this Ikar? Because when the, when the temple's no longer there, you got to be able to carry the principles with you. Say again, I just couldn't hear. When the, when the temple is no longer there, you have to be able to carry the principles with you wherever you are. Right, beautiful. Okay, so that's, Vicky's got a great point. You got to keep, keep the turn no matter what's going on. Um, I, I'd say furthermore, maybe even, you know, we don't, we don't think about it this way, but when the Christianity started, right, what was their big claim? Their claim was everything in the Torah is true. And it was very relevant in its time. But nowadays, don't worry, you don't need to keep the Torah anymore. We have a new Torah, right? So I'm not saying that the reason that this is a fundamental belief is because of the Christians, but it is a fundamental belief. Um, and our Christian counterparts definitely increase the importance of this belief that we can't just say that the Torah is going to go and change just like that, um, which is also, you know, maybe why many of the Rishonim thought this was so important. Okay. So, so any questions on just the basic fundamental belief before we move on to why the last Prakim and Yechezkel uh, seem to be so blatantly problematic for this? Okay. So this brings us to the question I want to discuss with you tonight, which is for those of you who read the Prakim um, and uh, you, know, you go through it with, with m most of the Perushim, which you can find on Yechezkel, you'll notice that this is a theme which is hard to understand how it fits, the, the Psuki Min Yechezkel, how it fits with the, this principle. Uh, just as an aside, Yechezkel is the only prophet we have whose prophecies 
also include laws meant for the people. Um, but it's hard to understate how many contradictions there seem to be between the laws he mentions and the ones in our Torah. So does anyone from their own reading remember any examples from, from what they saw? Anything which looked different from uh, things in the Torah? Many of them you need like someone to point out because it doesn't seem like such a big deal. I, I did do the calculation myself, but, but purportedly the measurements are, are different on the Mikdash. Correct. The, the, the measurements on the Mikdash are totally different. Interestingly, um, we'll, we'll come back to this, but we actually... Uh, our whole class, I'm in Smicha right now, so our class actually went to uh, Rabbi Reisman, who's known as a, an expert in Tanakh, and I was speaking to him about this, and he was most bothered by that fact, which Bernie just mentioned, that the way that the Mikdash and Yerushalayim are described, it's very clear that what we nowadays think of as the Mikdash and Yerushalayim, well, one of them isn't going to be where it is right now, meaning there's a clear difference in, uh, in space, which he spells out. Either the Beit Mikdash is not where we think the Beit Mikdash is going to be, or Yerushalayim is not going to be where we think Yerushalayim is going to be. So something's got to change. So uh, that, that's, that's, that's one uh, important difference. Okay. Any, any other suggestions are also uh, welcome. If not, I made a table for us just to get a sampling. So I'll, I'll share that. So over here, by the way, this is a picture of the Rambam. I have no idea if it is legitimate or not but it looks like a scholarly uh, medieval thinker. So we're, we're gonna stick with it. Uh, anyway, here are the ostensible differences, just this partial list between Yechezkel and the Torah. Um, let me know if I need to make it bigger or anything like that. Hopefully people can see. Again, partial list over here. So I just broke it down into two sections, two of the largest sections of differences, which are number one, the laws of the Kohanim, right? Kohanim of spe specific laws which apply to them. And then the sacrifices also, um, which the Torah spell out and which Yechezkel spell out, seem to be very different. So just one instance over here, we'll see. We'll go through them one by one, the garments. So in the Torah, it's clear the garments of the Kohen. Uh, actually, this is the only one which isn't so clear. The reason I'm quoting the Rambam is because it's based on, uh, not so clear in the Pesukim, but, but the garments, the way that we understand the halacha is that the the belt of the coin, the avnate, consisted of wool and linen. There was kilaim, right? Regularly, we don't wear wool and linen. That's a prohibited mixture. But the coin specifically was allowed to wear wool and linen. In fact, he had to wear wool and linen whenever he did the avodah, whenever he would work in the Beit HaMikdash, he does wear wool and linen. This is in, uh, this is how the, the, the halacha is learned, is understood from the Torah. However, if you look in Yechezkel... Isn't, isn't there uh, a distinction between uh, the coin Gadol and the coin Hedyot. It was the coin Gadol who had uh, Kalayim and was permitted to uh, to wear Shatnis. So uh, I, and I think it's the exact opposite. I think that it's every Kohen actually wears Shatnis, and the coin Gadol wears only four garments on on uh, Yom Kippur. I believe he doesn't wear Shatnis. Um, and, and we'll see. Actually, that'll come into part of this discussion over here, meaning. Uh, what Rashi says, well, well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it in a moment. But what Henry's pointing out is that the, only the Kohen wears shatnez. The Kohen Gadol does not wear shatnez. And the Psukim Yechezko, when it seems to discuss the Kohen, not the Kohen Gadol, but it seems to discuss the Kohen. So he says specifically, they shall wear linen clothes, and that wool shall not be upon them when they serve. So Rashi says, ah, you know, it must be. He he like breaks up the pasuk, and even though we weren't talking about the Kohen Gadol, he comes along and he says this must be talking about the Kohen Gadol, uh, and, and we'll get to that. But from the context of the psukim, and everything seems to just be talking about a normal kohen. What? Um, I'm just going to uh, mute. Um, I'll find out. I said. Okay, please feel free to unmute yourself um, if you have anything to say. But um, but in Yechezkel, it seems like a kohen, a normal kohen, will not be wearing shatnas. So his garments are going to gar are going to change and be similar to what the kohen gadol wears. Like, uh, like Henry pointed out. A second thing, a normal Kohen is prohibited. This is a Pasuk in, uh, in the Torah. He's not allowed to marry a divorcee. He is allowed to marry a widow. This is again, a normal, a normal Kohen. So uh, a divorcee in the Torah is a Grusha. He's not allowed to marry a Grusha, but he is allowed to marry an Almana, a widow. If you look in Yechezkel, so he's got a very interesting halach. He says, a Kohen may not marry a divorcee. So that all sounds the same. But he says he also is not allowed to marry a widow. And then he throws in a caveat, unless she is a widow from another Kohen. 
So if she was married to a Kohen and then that Kohen passed away, so then he would be allowed to marry that widow. But if that widow was a widower from, from a non Kohen, so then it would be a problem. So he throws in this new category, which we never see in the Torah of different types of widows. Okay, again, these are just examples. There are more than just these. One other example in the Torah, after a Kohen becomes Tame, so he requires seven days of purification. Um, and then after those, those uh, seven days, there's a paradum involved, but then he's able to go and work in the Beit HaMikdash. If you read the Pesukim in Yechezkel, it says that you have those seven days, and then it says, and then there'll be another seven days. So all of a sudden it requires 14 days before uh, being able to go and enter the Beit HaMikdash if a Kohen becomes Tame. So those are just a few, there are others also, but a few of the main differences by the laws of Kohanim. If we go to the sacrifices, it's like, you know, left and right, night and day. So for instance, there's interestingly a korban, which is talked about, which will be offered on the 14th of Nisan. That's the day before, um, the day before Pesach. Uh, he says one ox is offered. There is no ox, which we're aware of in the Torah, which is offered the day before, uh, the day before Pesach, right? The day before Pesach, we offer the, um, we have the korban Pesach, which we offer, but that's a sheep. That's, that's a, you know, a lamb. That's not a, that's not an ox. So we, we don't know exactly what that's, I mean, it's not that we don't know what it's referring to, but it does not conform to what the Torah seems to say at face value. Another, we're just gonna, you know, you can, you can just see the differences here. On Pesach, what are the offerings? Yechezkel says two oxen and one ram. Torah says seven oxen, seven rams. They both share a goat chatat offering, but they the meal offering actually has different measurements for exactly how much there's going to be. And then Yechezkel throws in seven lambs for, for good luck or something like that. So it doesn't seem to be the same at all. Sukkot offering, same thing. Uh, the, excuse me, this is the Torah. Um, I have it all backwards. The Torah says two oxen, one ram. And then on the right side was, was Yechezkel. I apologize about that. Um, in the Torah, it says a descending number of oxen each day on Sukkot. You offer from 13 to seven. On the first day, it's 13. Second day is 12. 11, 10, 9, etc. as the days go on. Yechezkel keeps it at seven all the time, the different number of rams, again, different meal offering, and the Torah has 14 lambs, which aren't uh, mentioned in Yechezkel. And then Shabbos, again, you can just look at the chart, you can see that there are differences. The same thing's true for Ashkodesh, I didn't even put it on because uh, I, I assumed people didn't need, uh, you know, every single difference over here. But at the end of the day, Again, a partial list over here, but especially with regards to the Korbanot and with regards to the laws of the Kohanim, there are differences left and right. The differences seem dizzying. So how are we supposed to deal with this? You have, you have one of the Ikari Amuna, right? One of the fundamental principles of faith. And the Rambam says explicitly, if a prophet's going to tell you a mitzvah is going to change, a mitzvah is going to add it to or taken away from, you kill him. Like it's, it's a a very extreme punishment for someone who does this. And then Yechezkel seems to be doing exactly that. So I, I hope uh, you're bothered by the question. If anyone has any thoughts on, on, on that or questions, please jump in. Well, what was the basis of his changing it? Um, try, trying to figure out who just spoke. I'm sorry. Oh, Arthur, oh. is that you? Yes, yes. I mean, on what basis did he make this change? How did he justify his changes? And why wasn't he killed? And why wasn't he killed? Right. So we want to know why he wasn't he killed. That was also a voice from heaven in the background. Yeah. Um, so, so exactly. I, I think that that's that's really the question, right? On what basis did he do it? He doesn't say. He just says this is going to be the law, and uh, and he leaves us guessing. I so maybe it was a, he came from a family of butchers, so it increased the number of uh, animals they sold. And ah, okay. you know? that's, that's, uh, that would be a, a shot which we're not going to give in this class. <laughs> well, the, the assumption is that he has Navua and that this, this is what he was told by God. And then, you know, God changes things. And this is, you know, if God can, wants to change the business, you know, it was the minority opinion. And uh, he's, he's not doing it on his own. He's doing it what, what God told him. But... I hear what you're saying, but according to the Rambam, if a Navi says, this is what God told me, he said we should change the mitzvah, so we should kill him. So, so why do we trust him when he says God tells us this? Or what right does he have to do that? Maybe it's all, maybe it's, it's not a Maisie act, it's a Shogeg act. He simply just didn't know, basically. 
the, the temple had not been in existence for a long time and the Messoa, he just confused the Messoa. I don't know if this is a proper statement or an improper statement, but ah. at least it's not intentional. I mean, the Gemara, the Gemara often argues, the Gemara often argues what, what, what the practice in the Mikdash was. Right, right. I, I guess we'd hope that uh, a prophet would have the right one right hope so. answer. One would hope so. And he also had the Torah, right? The Torah wasn't right. missing from Yechezkel. So it, it still remains... Uh, the no Kohanim, Kohanim, right? Who, who Kohanim can marry is going to be the same whether you're in the exile or not in the exile. So you have to... Something needs to be figured out. Okay, so so I'm hoping just to uh, you know emphasize the question. If you had uh, if you had an answer, you'd be ahead of a lot of uh, Rishonim and Nachronim. So not that you're not welcome to have the answer, but it, it's been it's been discussed. Believe it or not, we were not the first ones to uh, notice these discrepancies. You know, we did not uh, we did not discover America over here. Chazal mentioned in at least three different Gemaras, different Gemaras. I'm sure Midrashim all over. But the issue, which is that Yechezkel does not seem to conform with the Torah. So one Gemar Menachot actually uh, spends a whole page just working out, reconciling a small fraction of these contradictions. It doesn't go through all of them, but it says the Torah says this and Yechezkel says that. No, don't worry if you reread it like, you know, X, Y, and Z, so you're good to go. So I'm not going to, we're not going to go through all of those uh, answers. And those answers honestly aren't sufficient for the number of, they don't answer all the problems, all the issues, but maybe just one little point, which the Gemara ends with, which I think is um, instructive, is as follows. He says, the Gemara says, Amrab Yehuda Amarav, Zahur Oso Ha'ish Lato. There's a certain person who shall always remember for good. The Hanina ben Chizkiah Shemo. His name is Hanina, the son of Chizkiah. She Omalehu, if it weren't for him, Nignaz Sefer Yechezkel. They would have buried, they would have gotten rid of. Chazal would have said, we got to, you know, cross this one off our look, off our list of the Tanakh. Shayu Dvarav Sosrin Divrei Torah, because its words seemingly contradict the words of Torah. Ma'asa, what did this Hanina ben Chizkiah do? Hela Shalosh Meos Garve Shemen. He took 300 pitchers of oil for light. He was going to go use them for candlelight. The Yashav Bialiyah, and he sat in, t- in an upper story in an attic, Vidarsho. And he went ahead and he darshaned the Sefer Yechezkel, so that everything would end up working out the same way as the Torah indicates. So I don't know if 300 jugs is, uh, you know, quite accurate. That sounds like uh, quite a long time to be stuck in an attic. But even if we accept a bit of exaggeration, you know, in the amount of oil, which was necessary to go answer all the issues, it indicates an incredible amount of work necessary to fit the text of the Yechezkel on one hand with the accepted halacha on the other hand. So throughout our prokim, very interesting, if you just follow, you know, the different mafarshim, you'll see different approaches. So Rashi follows this approach of the Gemara. Rashi says he's going to reinterpret, reinterpret every single pasuk, pasuk after pasuk, in very creative ways so that there are no contradictions. So I'll just share with you, you know, one way, some of, uh, some uh, creative interpretation so that you don't have any issues. So here's one we mentioned, we mentioned in the table that a Kohen, according to Yechezkel, although the Torah says a Kohen can marry an Almana, he is allowed to marry a widow, the Psukim and Yechezkel seem to indicate otherwise. So we'll do simple translation, and then we'll do Rashi's translation. So simple translation here, the Almana Gusha loikhu lahem linashim, a widow and a divorcee, they, the Kohanim, cannot take as wives. Ki'im betulot mizera beit Yisrael, they are only allowed to take uh, virgins from the house of God, and if you have a almana, if you have a widow who is a widow from a Kohen, meaning her first marriage was from a Kohen to a Kohen, so then you're allowed to marry her. That's that marry her. That's the simple, simple explanation of this pasuk. Problem is it goes against the Torah. So how do you reread this? So Rashi says we have to splice this pasuk into two parts. The first part of the pasuk is going to be talking about a Kohen gadol who in fact is prohibited from marrying an almana in the Torah, from marrying a widow. And the second part is going to be talking about um, Kohanim. So he reads as follows. They're not allowed to marry again a widow or a divorcee. And that's, that, that's referring to a Kohen Gadol, the, right, the high priest. They can only marry a virgin. That's referring to the Kohen Gadol. And then a normal Kohen, big pause over here, period, end of sentence, new discussion without telling you that. This is a very hard read, but a widow who is a widow, 
That's, that's all it means. A widow who is a widow. Mikohen, Mikohen regularly means from a Kohen, but Rashi says Mikohen means certain Kohanim, like some of the priests, Ikahu, meaning the non Kohen Gadol is allowed to marry um, an Almano, a, a widow, but a norm, but a Kohen Gadol cannot. So that's, that's like uh, just one Pasuk over here. We're not going to go through more than that. I shared the text with you in the source sheet um, of Rashi in source five, but um, in context, why is this different? difficult? Because in context, it's clear that we weren't talking about the Kohen Gadol, the way Rashi interprets the first clause, uh, but we were talking about a normal Kohen. So split, splitting up the Pasuk into two different types of Kohanim is also, you know, pretty creative. And the syntax is generally just strange. The word Mikohen does not generally mean some Kohanim. It means um, from a Kohen, which is what the simple interpretation is. But that's what Rashi has, feels he has to do, right? Um, and unfortunately, we don't have the answers that Hananya gave to all the contradictions, save one sifre, uh, which answers some question about different measurements of mincha offerings. And Rashi actually bemoans this fact. Rashi says it's, you know, it's a tragedy that we don't have all of Hananya's work. He says in source six over here um, that uh, he quotes the, the Gemara we quoted recently, we mentioned earlier. Rabotenu amru shebikshu ligno sefer yechezkel sheyudvar sosim divrei Torah. They were going to go and Bury Sefer Yechezkel, get rid of it. We have this Hanani ben Chizkiah who darshaned, who, chained, who re- told you how to reread every Pasuk. In our sins, we no longer have that, uh, those you know, interpretations. Mashadarash, the Korbanos Ha'ele. Rashi is dealing with a specific issue in the Korbanos. He says, I don't know what he did with these Korbanot. Why on earth is there a cow, a bull, brought on the 14th day of Nisan? So Rashi, Rashi is, you know, he's trying to stay within what Chazal tell us. And he's saying it's, it's hard, you know. There's so many psukim I have to reinterpret. And the interpretation is not um, easy. So it's just noteworthy that this approach of Rashi is very unique to Rashi. So if anyone's ever read through Rashi's commentary on the Torah, he says all the time, I'm here just lefarish pshuto shel mikra. My goal is just to explain the simple reading of the text. And he'll say, I'm not going to quote to you the midrashim, you know, all the special uh, uh, exegesis, which doesn't seem to fit the simple text. Um, I give you one source uh, in, in, uh, in source seven. I put one source uh, on, on the sheet. Um, I'll share with that. I, I, I don't think I put it on the chat. So maybe I'll just do that, by the way. Um, I did put one source or seven where Rashi does that, um, but uh, but what's clear is that in our chap- chapters, in, in these chapters in Yechezkel, Rashi says, to the end of my regular rule, I'm not interpreting Pshuto Shal Mikra, I'm not interpreting the simple explanation because it seems to contradict the halacha and it cannot be the intended meaning. So that's Rashi, right? Rashi, most of our sources in Chazal, it seems like a contradiction, but we're gonna go through one by one you know, whether it's five examples or 20 examples, and we will reinterpret every single one of these so that there are no contradictions. Okay, that's, that's approach number one. Uh, approach number two, I think, is much more exciting. Um, but any thoughts before we move on to that approach? Just about Rashi and this basic, this basic you know, approach to the issue. Okay. So the other approach, you can guess, right? If the first approach is to say there's no contradiction, the second approach is going to be to say that there is a contradiction. So approach number two is to do the exact opposite of Rashi. We're going to take all these contradictory psukim at their face value, and we're going to accept them. It's not even a minority view. This is not, uh, you know, this is most definitely a widespread view. It's taken by many Rishonim and Achronim. So just for example, the Radak, he's living in the 1200s. Um, so he gives, he, he takes this approach. 200 years later, the Abar Benel says the exact same thing. He's in the 1400s. And then, in case you just thought maybe there's just a few Rishonim who said this before Ani Mamin got into our Sidurim. By the way, Ani Mamin got into our Sidurim, I think, at the end of the 1500s. So it's, it's, been, uh, it's been well established. But the Malbim is the third big hitter who takes this approach. He's all the way in the 1800s. So according to them, according to the Radak, the Abar Benel, the Malbim and others, but you know, those are probably our, uh, uh, that's, that's more than enough. Shockingly, it seems that the Torah laws will indeed change. 
So for instance, Kohanim are not going to be able to marry many of the women who they previously were permitted to. Um, they'll be wearing different priestly garments when they serve in the Beit HaMikdash. And they'll need an extra week of purification after becoming Tomei before they can work in the Beit HaMikdash. Right? Those are just some of the examples. In fact, even when the Pshat can conform to the Halakha, even when, uh, you know, maybe not the easiest read, but an easy read could fit with the Torah we have, the Malbim gets so excited with his approach, he says, nah, you know, you could have read it like it fits, but it doesn't fit. And I'll show you why it doesn't fit. And he very comfortably interprets them as being very different. So for instance, uh, he interprets uh, certain psukim as saying the Kohanim will have a new requirement. Uh, this one, uh, you know, is going to be hard during COVID, but we'll have to get a haircut like the Kohen Gadol. They have to get a very specific haircut, very short. Um, the Kohen Gadol had a certain haircut, which apparently was very difficult to do, which made him look particularly... Uh, I guess, um, honorable. So, so to every coin will have to get that haircut. He says also that, uh, that although previously only a coin who was serving in the Beit HaMikdash, one who was doing the Abu the one who was doing the, the primary um, acts in the Beit HaMikdash couldn't drink wine beforehand. He says now, anytime a coin goes to the Beit HaMikdash, even if he's disqualified from serving, he's not going to be able to drink wine. He is going to be prohibited. Those are just a few examples, but the Malbim, you know, really, really gets excited about this and goes full force with this approach. So the Kohanim are going to have to have, are going to have many new religious observances and strictures. Their clothing is even going to change. So how do we deal with this, right? What happened to our foundation of thought, our foundation of faith? So the, the Malbim, like I said, was in the 1800s, was quite aware of the princi this principle of faith. We have record of the Ani Malmins in our Sidurins, in, in our Sidurim since the late 1500s. Malbim's living in the 1800s. So for 200 years, this has been accepted, normative, Orthodox Judaism, so to speak. We don't have to call it Orthodox, but it was normative Judaism. Orthodox didn't exactly, you know, exist necessarily um, in the 1500s. But did he not think that his thesis was controversial? Right, we're just, we're really just coming back to square one. We thought we had an answer. Radak, Abarbanel, Malbim, you have no answer. Figure it out, haha. -ha. So we're, we're, we're gonna, we're still stuck. All good? Okay. Rabbi, why yeah. are we going through such contortions? If I mean, I don't know if it was with you, but certainly with Ola, with our Buchla, we had long discussions about who actually wrote the Navi. Was it written in the, in the, in the lives of the Navi? Was it written later? Was it written by the base Medrash later? So if, if, you know, if it was written later by other people who were just recalling what the Navi said, maybe perhaps errors did pop in, or maybe there was a rada when, when it was transcribed from one cloth to another. Why, you know, why do we have to go through this contortions to mesh them and th rather than just say, perhaps there was an error in the Navi. Uh, so I'm not sure which discussion you're referring to. It might have been the one which we had, but even those who say that Yechezkel and other Navim weren't written by that Navi themselves, don't say that the words of that Navi aren't to be taken, you know, with uh, incredible um, seriousness. And it's not that people are doubting the veracity of that tradition. It's just a question of, was it written by the Navi himself or was it the ideas of the Navi which were passed down? But at the end of the day, you know, these words are canonized. Um, we, we learn so much from what the Navim say. So whether it's exactly him or it's a very strong, strong tradition of what he said or scrolls of what he said later. So uh, I think still you have to take very, very seriously what he says and try and fit it with, with um, you know, the accepted halakha. Okay. Uh, I have a question uh, yeah. with regard, with this, regarding Rambam. Didn't he feel that the um, Carbonos were really not really ideal at all and that perhaps one day we're not going to have to have them? I don't know. Did he go that far that, you know, we're not going to have to do Carbonos altogether? So that's changing a lot. That, that's major. I think, I think he said that carbonos were never intended and that, and that um, Hashem kind of realized, if you want to say it that way, that everybody else had carbonos. He knew that the Jews would start to ask for them, but that actually we were not supposed, that's what I, I once learned, that the Rambam thought we weren't supposed to have carbonos. Right. So, so I once gave a share on this topic. I don't want to get too sidetracked on the details of Corbanos specifically, but the Rambam is clear actually 
um, that Korbanu are going to occur in the times of the Beit HaMikdash. We can talk uh-huh. at some point about Rav Kook. Rav Kook in one place seems to say otherwise. But the Rambam says they're bidiyavit. They weren't an ideal form of service. But at the end of the day, God put it into the system. So we're gonna, we're gonna, the system's going to say this, the way that the system was written. So within the Rambam, the Rambam is uh, very consistent that the mitzvot are not going to change. Um, mm-hmm. But but actually, we'll get to your example because because shortly we're going to discuss maybe there are other examples of contradictions to this principle um, outside of Sefer Yechezkel. Okay. So I spoke, I have uh, learning in uh, Yeshiva University, in the Beit Midrash there, I had the privilege of having quite a few big, you know, rabbis who are quite the scholars to just discuss things with. So uh, I spoke with two people, uh, Rabbi Wiederblank and Rabbi Tursky. Uh, both of them are experts in the area of Jewish thought and uh, Jewish philosophy. Um, and both of them told me that they didn't know offhand. Uh, one of them I actually spoke with three or four times and kept on telling me he hadn't yet figured out the answer. Um, but but this, this is a, a question which bothered them at the very least. I had the opportunity last week with my class who we went to Rabbi Reisman. Uh, he's a renowned expert in Nach, as well as a notable posig um, in America. I asked him, we had an open question and answer. I asked him, you know, what's the answer? He said he's had this question for a very long time and he did not know what the answer was. So uh, it's, it's a question which a lot of, you know, big minds have struggled with. Um, I found in my research of this only one answer, you know, which maybe answers the question. And Rabbi Wiederblank, who I spoke with, said, you should check this book. This book probably will give you an answer. So the book was uh, written, it's like uh, one of the, back when Art Scroll, like, they, they had much thicker volumes. So they had like a three-part series on Sefer Yechezkel. It was written by Rabbi Eisenman. I don't know exactly who that is, but he's apparently the expert on Yechezkel. So he, Rabbi Wiedemann said, if you, you know, you mind that book, you'll find an answer somewhere. So he does in fact have an answer. Uh, props to uh, Rabbi Wiederblank for uh, finding it. So maybe before we get to that answer, you know, we'll just, we'll just give it by way of background. Um, you know, this isn't the only place where we have seeming contradictions from our sources to the, this principle of faith, right? There are plenty of Midrashim and Chazal, like one we just mentioned, maybe something Rav Kook picks up on that seem to say mitzvot are going to change in the future. Like maybe we won't be offering korbanot in the future. Or there's other instances where there, uh, there's a Midrash floating around um, that pig will one day become kosher. Maybe uh, you've heard of that one. Or uh, that in the times of Mashiach, all the holidays will be nullified besides for Purim. Whatever, these Midrashim are floating around. Um, and the truth is the Rishonim and Achronim are already, de- already deal with these. Uh, so for an example, you know, pig will become kosher. What do you mean pig's going to become kosher? That goes against the Torah. So the Ritva says it's not ri- literal. What's pig? Pig is Christianity. So that's not something we, you know, necessarily spread, but that's what the Ritva said, that it's Christianity. It means that they're no longer going to attack us in the times of Mashiach. They'll become kosher, so to speak. Alternatively, the Orachaim says it is literal. Pig will become kosher, which is very exciting for those who don't particularly like fake and bacon. Um, but it's not that the Torah is going to change, but that the pig's bodies will actually change. So the Torah says if you have split hooves and you chew your cud, you're going to be kosher. So the pig's bodies will change to fit that you will be, uh, you know, have split hooves and, uh, and chew your cud. But at the end of the day, the Rishonim deal with these problematic Midrashim. So there's one, one Rishon, the Rajbah, who is normally thought of as, uh, as uh, an analytical Talmudist and Halachist, but he actually wrote a commentary on the non-halachic parts of the Talmud as well. Um, and in one place, he spends a lot of time focused on these questions. He goes through many examples, and he concludes that none of Chazal's words violate this principle, and mitzvot cannot change or be nullified like we would expect him to say. What's fascinating, though, is that there's one particular example in which he doesn't feel the need to reinterpret it. He says, no, that one's actually, that one's fine. So, so what's that one which is fine? So there's a Mishnah in Brachot. There's a Mishnah in Brachot, uh, I saw it in the Gemara. So on the Gemara, it was on Yudbet on Bet on 12b. It discusses a mitzvah which does not get too much press. There's a mitzvah that we should all remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim. We should remember the exodus that we left from Egypt every single day. Now, how do we do this? So we do this because it's in our text in Shema. At the end of Shema in the paragraph of Vayomer. So we say at the end, Ani Hashem Elokeichem, I am Hashem your God, Hashem Tseisi Aschem Eretz Mitzrayim, who took you out of Egypt, so boom, just like that, you read a line and you fulfill your obligation to remember uh, being taken out of Egypt every single day. So for our purposes, 
What's important is that the Chachamim in the Mishnah thought it would be a requirement in the times of Mashiach as well. While it seems that Ben Zoma disagreed. There was this Tana called Ben Zoma who disagreed, um, which brings us to the following source. Let's jump a little bit to source nine. The Gemara says as follows. What's this discussion between Ben Zoma and the Chachamim? Tanya. The Brisa says, Amalehen ben Zoma le Chachamim. Ben Zoma said to the Chachamim, Bechimaz kirim yetzias mitzayim limosa Mashiach. Will we really still remember, will we still mention yetzias mitzayim, the Exodus, in the times of the Mashiach? Yalok kvar nemar, but there's a Pasuk which says the exact opposite in Yirmiyahu. Hinei amim ba'im nu Hashem. Behold, the days will come. V'lo yomru od chai Hashem asher halas b'nei Yisrael meretz mitzayim. We won't say anymore that this is the God who took me out of Egypt. Kim chai Hashem asher halas. But rather, this is the God who took me up and brought me from the northern land, and from all the lands, and uh, from all the lands which they, he, they had been driven to. So basically, Ben Zoma says there's this Pasuk in Yermiyahu, which says we're no longer going to remember um, Yitzhak Mitzrayim in the future. We're not going to have to remember the Exodus. Rather, we're going to remember the miracles which took place right before um, the coming of, of uh, you know, Olam Haba or whatever it is, the Mashiach, when we're all brought together, uh, not on, you know, maybe through LL planes, but some, some way to get us out of the Galut and into Eretz Yisrael together, the miracles which occurred over then. So to summarize, right, Ben Zoma is saying that in the future, the mitzvah of remembering the Exodus is going to change. In the times of Mashiach, rather than mention the mi- miracles of Egypt, we're going to mention the miracles which bring about the final redemption. So it sounds very similar, right? Like a total change of a mitzvah, like changing the garments which a Kohen wears. So the Rajba deals with that. The Rajba deals with that. And he says, it's not a problem. He says, why isn't it a problem? He says that the mitzvah to recall the Exodus is fundamentally a requirement upon us never to forget God's hashkacha, his providence, and miraculous intervention on behalf of his people. So after redemption occurs, after you know the geula happens, it'll be even better illustrated by those miracles, which brought about the Geula, than the miracles of the Exodus. So he says the mitzvah hasn't changed. It's remained, in fact, essentially unchanged. We're remembering God's providence. Sounds quite like, uh, so, so it's quite an idea. So if Eisman suggests, just to pull it together here, he says maybe the very same line of reasoning underlies what's going on over here. The Radak, the Abarbanel, and the Malbim over here. He says the mitzvot are indeed internal, eternal, right? Yechezkel simply reveals that certain details will conform to reflect the new circumstances of greater sanctity. So the higher standards imposed upon Kohanim reflect that greater sanctity. And almost all the changes reflect some increased level of chumra, some increased level of stringency. Why? Because the level of Kedusha, the level of spirituality is going to elevate at the times of, uh, at the, times of the redemption. And the level of the Kohanim are going to increase from normal Kohanim to closer to Kohen Gadol's, to closer to that of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So their higher sanctity will mean that they don't wear wool, just like the high priest doesn't wear wool. Um, like the, the Kohen Gadol who only wears, wears linen. That's, that's his approach. Why are people snagging this $89 portable AC? I recently discovered how to refrigerate any room. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I have a question though, on um, the, uh, one of the, uh, uh, one of the differences that, that you didn't include in your list is the one at the very end of that chapter, the, the, the one about dealing with the Kohanim, is, is that uh, the Kohanim will not eat from the Nevela Utrefa, min ha-behema, min ha-of, min ha-behema. So doesn't that imply that it's only the Kohanim who will not be allowed to eat from Nevela Utrefa? And thus, in a sense, it seems to imply that that Yisrael would be allowed to eat from it. That's interesting. Um, I don't remember exactly how the um, Mefarshim deal with that. I do remember them asking the question that no one's allowed to eat in a Velo trade, but not a Kohen and not a Yisrael. Um, I, I, look, I think it's I, I, I think it's okay to repeat a stricture in Esau, I don't think that contradicts what the uh, what Rabbi Zimmer is saying, basically. It's just it's just repeating among the Kohen story. You're right, it applies to other people. Okay, it applies to other people. I don't see that as a, it, it, it's, a it's a point or a question. I don't think it's overwhelming. Uh, yeah, but all due respect to the story. Yeah. But, but, but Yechesko is trying to highlight 
uh, as you said, the higher level of Kedusha right. of the, okay. the Kohen. And so, in a sense, by, by highlighting it, it seems to diminish the level of Kedusha of, of a non Kohen. Okay. So, Maybe. Uh, Maybe. One will take it. I'll have to get back to you on that. I do, I'm trying to remember there was some, the way one Rishon, at least I saw explained, was that for some reason you would have thought that a Kohen nowadays is allowed to have a Nevela. I can't remember why. But now that's no longer going to be the case, meaning everyone will still not allowed to be have a Nevela. But we specifically had to tell you also Kohan. I can't remember what, why that is. So I'll have to, um, I'll, I'll have to get back to you about that. Okay, thank you. Question. Yeah. Uh, uh, just, just, just a note. Uh, rabbi Eisenman is the the rabbi of uh, Avas in Passaic. Really? Where, where okay. The goes to show. Thank you very much. So I didn't know that. I just had a name, and I I should have done better research on, on who he was. I, I wasn't even sure how old he was. So thank you very much. He is, uh, he is a musmach of of, of uh, Reitz. Really? Okay. Well, he wrote a fantastic sefer. You ever get to see him? Um, I think okay. it's different, Rabbi Eisenman. It's one night. Uh, it's a different Eisenman. That, that's a, several families have the same name. Uh, okay, so we'll, we'll get back to everyone on that also. But there is a Rabbi Eisenman who wrote this book, and it was a, a very good book. Um, so uh, there are more sources in this source sheet. I don't think that um, time permits for us to necessarily go through them properly. But I just wanted to demonstrate with, with uh, some of the sources. You can go through them on your own time now that it's shared. But uh, also, I believe it was sent out via email. But there are hints in the Rishonim to this idea. So like the Abar Banel, for instance, I have it highlighted in my version. I don't know if it's highlighted in yours, because I think I made that change afterwards. But the Abar Banel says that the reason the Kohanim are going to change their halachos is because she tosef kedusha sam kolkach, that they will have so much more increased kedusha, they will have so much more increased sanctity, which is basically exactly what Rabbi Eisman's uh, picking up on. And just another, um, again, I'm just where we're going through these quickly, but that's only because I want to do the Hadron and not keep people um, over time. If you look at the Malbim on Korbanot, right? Korbanot are something, which again, there's a whole bunch of issues with the uh, differences between the Korbanot and, and uh, the, uh, the Torah's, Torah versus Yechezkel. All of a sudden, if you look at the Malbim, the Malbim gets very upset. He says, how could the sacrifices change? It contradicts. It's not allowed to contradict, add, or take away from the Torah's laws. Don't we have the Ikari Amuna? What happened over here? Like, uh, but the Malbim is the very one who a moment ago reinterpreted every single Pasuk by the Kohanim to say that laws were going to change. And he doesn't seem bothered by that contradiction. Right? So the, if you take Rabbi Eisman's approach, it's very nice. What, what, what did and didn't bother the Malbim? The Malbim was comfortable saying that there's going to be more strictures. There's going to be more humrot which the Kohanim keep because they're on a higher level and their begadim will re reflect those of the Kohen Gadol because they're on a higher level. But for the Korbanim to just randomly change, if you look at this list, it's pretty hard to figure out how, uh, how anything correlates to anything. You know, uh, okay, so we have a few more uh, oxen and rams over here. We're missing seven lambs on Pesach. Um, for some reason, we're no longer descending the number of oxen. Instead of 13 to seven, it's always seven. Like there's no rhyme or reason to why these these uh, korbanot change. So the Malbim has a whole approach to answer the the korbanot. What he basically says is that the korbanot mentioned here in Yechezkel are not the korbanot to which we think of as the regular ones, which are requirement every year. But this was a one-time horat shah. It was a one-time consecration offering. They were trying to uh, bring extra korbanot just one year. Um, to, to go and kind of consecrate the new Beit HaMikdash. But this has nothing to do with your average Pesach, Sukkot, and Shabbos offerings. All those would be brought anyways. And then these are just a one-time addition, but not a change or addition to a mitzvah. A change or an addition to a mitzvah is something which is eternal. But a one-time thing, we have Horat Shah, we have things which a Navi says to do all the time, right? Eliyahu says, uh, come to Hara Carmel, I'm going to go build a Bama. It's okay for a Navi to go and tell you to do a one-time thing. So the Malvin basically reinterprets all the sacrifices. But why does he feel the need to reinterpret everything? He feels the need to reinterpret everything because it doesn't fit with this beautiful approach of um, revising. So just because we, we do have a, a hadron, I'm, I'm truncating a little bit just so that we make it and that I'm not taking up uh, everyone's time any more than, than what's allotted over here. I just want to you know, conclude a little bit and I'm around afterwards to speak for as long as uh, anyone would like to. 
this is the best answer I could find, right? I, I met a lot of people who were bothered by the question. Today I had the opportunity, just today, I finally had the opportunity to speak with Rav Tversky, um, again, one of the, one of the experts in uh, Jewish philosophy and Jewish thought. I told him, you know, this approach of, of the Raj, but I was excited to tell him, like, I found an answer. You know, what do you think? I basically asked him. And he was not so excited. Um, you know, he said that, what, so all of a sudden, as long as you're fulfilling the main reason of the mitzvah, you know, now it's, now it's okay to just change the mitzvah. So he actually gave me an example. He said, we have a mitzvah on Hanukkah, right, to go ahead and be mefarsim the next, to go publicize the miracle that happened on Hanukkah. So he said, I have a great idea. What's the best way to publicize the miracle of uh, Hanukkah nowadays? Just put it on Twitter. You don't need a light of Hanukkah menorah. Just write, God, you know, saved us in the war and the oil stayed lit. It was, you know, lit, so to speak, uh, for those uh, who knows how, know how other people speak. But he said, obviously, that's not the case. You can't just say, I'm trying to fulfill the reason, so now I can get rid of the, the mitzvot. We don't generally take such, a, such an approach. It's at least not the uh, orthodox approach, that's for sure. So what, what exactly does the Rashba mean that you can just change the mitzvah to fulfill the reason? And what does uh, Rabbi Eisman mean that we can just, the mitzvah can change because the Kedusha changes or new realities change, you know, the best way to fulfill these mitzvot. So he wasn't sure. He said, obviously, it's not comparable to the, you know, Hanukkah case on Twitter. Um, but maybe it's only when there's a pasuk, when there's a verse which tells you that there's going to be a change. Maybe that's different than when we just make up that distinction on our own. But he was, he was hesitant. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure. You know, maybe, maybe, um, uh, I'm not sure, right? So I, I hope there's something that's right. It needs still some, uh, some hammering out. Um, I have some solace though from the following Gemara, which deals with, again, there's a whole bunch of these contradictions. And in one of them, and we're, again, the details aren't so, so important. But on the last, sorry for scrolling so quickly, but on the last Gemara over here, the last source, what should have been 13, but forgot to be numbered, uh, Rabbi Yochanan's asked a specific question relating to these Pesukim and Yechezkel. Again, details not so important. And Am Rabbi Yochanan, Parsha Zu Eliyahu Asi Lidarsha. This Parsha, we're going to leave for Eliyahu. Elijah the prophet, he'll take care of it. He'll figure out the answer. Right, so even Rabbi Yochanan at some point throws up his hands. He says, it's okay if we're left with attention. What's important, right, a attention, not, not attention. Uh, so what, what's important is that we accept that the Torah is divine, that we recognize infinite divine wisdom can't always be understood by finite beings, that we accept Moshe Rabbeinu's Torah, and we accept the words of Yechezkel because we know he's God's true prophet. So what do we do to reconcile the two? You know, we don't necessarily know how to reconcile the two. Um, and the discrepancies we recognize are a product of our own lack of knowledge. And the resolutions will hopefully one day be uh, understood when Eliyahu comes, we pray speedily and in our days. So I, I'd love to stay for questions. I just want to um, do the Hadron with everyone. And then I'm happy to take comments, questions, thoughts, anything else. Um, so let's just, let me just share this and we'll finish together. I asked a few people to join me um, in the Hadron, but I checked my email and it seems I didn't get too many yeses. So I think we have, I'll, I'll be reading a lot. Um, share screen. Okay. So first of all, a huge mazel tov to everyone for finishing, uh, those, who, those who finished Sebri uh, Yechezkel and those who didn't for coming just to listen to these shiurim. Yechezkel is a very underappreciated and understudied sefer with, you know, a lot of gems in it. Um, I definitely enjoyed learning it and giving the shiurim. So a big yashikoch to everyone on this list, everyone not on this list, and we apologize for any omissions. I'm gonna leave it here for a second. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna start the Hadron. Please, uh, Bernie, start us off. I'm gonna do this, this uh, Asher Yecheskel. 
Hadronalach Sefi Cheskel, Hadronalach Tadachalach Sefi Cheskel, Tadachalan, Lonit Nashiminach Sefi Cheskel, Lonit Nashiminan, Global Maiden, Global Madate. Hadronalach Sefi Cheskel, Badrachalan, Datach, Datanalach Sefi Cheskel, Tadachalan, Lonit Nashiminach Sefi Cheskel, Lonit Nashiminan, Global Maiden, Global Madate. Hadronalach Sefi Cheskel, Badrachalan, Tatanalach Sefi Haskel, but Tatahalan, Lord Nashemina Sefi Haskel, but Nashemina, no bar my dead, bar my dear Tate. Did you also, and please? You were Tom Fanecha, don't allow me of Tainus, Tate or Tha, no tenable myself, Tame Imanuma Ba, Halina, my papa, or me by papa, and Achim by papa, Hai by papa, Baba, Papa, Rafa, my papa, or Hush by papa, Sukh by papa, Arab by papa, Dor by papa. Okay. Ha-Rebna-Adunai-Elohenu-Esti-Brei-Torah-Tachab-Efinu-Befifi-Yod-Am-Chab-Eisti-Yisrael-Kulani-Yod-Eish-Mech-Avlam-Edei-Torah-